70. Song number 170. I serve a risen Savior, he's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever men may say. 
I see his hand of mercy, I hear his voice of cheer, and just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me alone. Good morning to you all. Welcome to all that is listening online also. Some of you I know are at the cabin this weekend, so we welcome you with our service this morning. Again, this is a special week for Christians. It's a week that brought a lot of sorrow to our Jesus. It's a week that will give us, gave us life so that we can live. And hopefully this week can be a, joy, a joyful time for us. It's a sad time, but at the same time to know what Jesus did for you and I. My message my title of my message this morning is From Palm Branches to a Crown of Thorns. And my main message will be coming out of Luke 19. But before I go to Luke 19, I want to go back in the Old Testament 
and look at a prophecy from one of the prophets. And the, Ezekiel, I'm sorry, uh, back to Zechariah chapter 9. Zechariah chapter 9 gave us a glimpse, gave, the, children, gave the, the people of Israel a glimpse of what is coming. And the time frame between the prophecy that was spoken by Zechariah was approximately 500 years. There's a 500 year window between what I'm going to read in Luke to what Zechariah pre- announced in Chapter 9 or verse 9. This is what Zechariah says. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, a colt, the fool of a donkey. And as, again, you could make a sermon out of that, just that verse. What do you see in the lower part of the verse? He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey. That verse speaks peace to me. This man was coming for peace for the nations. And as the children of Israel, as as the Israelites, they were looking for a one that would set them free from the Roman oppression. They were looking for a physical king, a king that would fight for them. But this king was different that was coming. This was a peaceful king. And I thought about that. Peace, I thought about that about peaceful. You know, a peaceful king leads to peaceful people. A humble king leads to humble people. A gentle king leads to gentle people. And that's who Jesus was. He came as a king, but a lowly king, riding on a colt. The lowest of the lowest. And I thought about that some more of this verse. God's people will not be a people of war and conflict. They will be gentle and lowly people of peace. That's what I see out of this verse. If we truly believe in our King Jesus, He's gentle and lowly. Peace for all men, for all mankind. But that's not what they were looking for. Like I said earlier, they were looking for someone that would come and set them free from the Romans. And again, as we think about Luke chapter 19, if you haven't turned there, you can turn there now. But Luke 19 paints us a pretty good picture of what took place that week before Jesus' crucifixion. It's a week for the people. It was a glorious week. As we'll see in these verses. I'll be starting at verse 28 of Luke. And when he said this, he went on, to, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. And he came to pass when he drew near to Bethpage and Bethany to the mount called Olivet. And he said to his disciples, saying, Go into the village opposite you, where, whereas you enter, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Loose it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you loosing it? Thus you should say to him, because the Lord has need of it. So those who went set their way and found it just as he had said to them. And as they were as they were loosing the colt, the owners of it said to them, Why are you loosing the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of him. Then they brought him to Jesus, and he, 
and they threw their own clothes on the colt, and they sat Jesus on him. And as he went, many spread their clothes on the road. And when he, and as he was drawing near to this, the, the, I'm sorry. Then as he was drawing near the, the mount, towards the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of these other disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice, saying, "For all the mighty works they have seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest." And some of the Pharisees called out to the people, in the, and some of the Pharisees called to him. From the crowd, teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he said to them, I tell you that if if they shall keep silent, the stones will immediately cry out. Now as he drew near, he saw the city and he wept. He wept over it, saying, if you had known, even you, especially this your day, the things that make you more for you, make for you peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when your enemies will Build and embark around you, surrounding you and close in on every side, and level you and your children with, within you to the ground, and they will, will not leave you in one stone upon another, because you did not know the time of your visitation. For Jesus, as we think about what was taking place, as we think about life here on this earth, what do we do when we call a leader? It's called a day of inauguration. A day, day set aside for celebration. A day outside of rejoicing. For the people, they did not understand. They didn't understand what was happening. But they became part of it. They came part of the celebration. And for Jesus, I don't believe it was so joyful. As we see in the later verses, he wept over Jerusalem. But just a little bit of context here. Bethpage was approximately about a two-mile journey from Jerusalem. So as you can imagine, Jesus starting on top of the mountain and working himself down into Jerusalem. And as the The crowds gathered, disciples gathered to sing and to praise him. But I think it's very important that we understand the choice of animal that Jesus chose. A donkey. A donkey was portrayed portrayed as a symbol of service, suffering, and peace and humility. That's what a donkey in those times were portrayed as. But Jesus did not present himself as a king. He was silent. With, I'm sure with a lot of thoughts going through his mind. And as they came towards Jerusalem, they laid clothes. And they weighed palm branches. Again, we don't see in Luke's account here. But if we go to the John's account, we will see that they were waving palm branches and lay them before Jesus as he came into Jerusalem. Palm branches were a symbol of victory. Triumph. But five days later, the same people, the same crowds, were placing a crown of thorns on his head. And again, their thoughts, as the scriptures, every one of the gospels talks about, the disciples, remember the prophecy came from Zechariah. But for most, they got caught up in it. I believe we see that they got caught up in this celebration. Celebration, they didn't know what they were celebrating about. So I ask the question to us. Can us, can we be guilty of the same celebration? Living for Jesus one day and then living for the world the next. Is that how we see King Jesus in our lives? 
He's there when we need him or when we want him. I ask the question, are we guilty? As same as that crowd was guilty, as guilty as, as we are sometimes. Does our talk match our walk? In line with the commitment that we made with our Lord Jesus. I ask myself that. And I ask you ask yourself that. Does our walk and our talk line up with the commitment that we have made with our Jesus? And as they continue to journey towards Jerusalem... The Pharisees called out to Jesus. Jesus rebuked your disciples. They were being, they were jealous. They were saw that people were starting to turn their hearts towards him. And they were celebrating. And for them, that didn't feel very good. And again, he called, they called out to Jesus to rebuke his disciples. And Jesus says, I tell you, if they should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. Jesus is someone we celebrate. We talk about. We rejoice. We share with our neighbors. We share with our friends. Because if we don't, the earth's glories will. The stones, as Jesus talks about, is the earth. He was talking about the earth itself. We are called to celebrate, to glorify Jesus. Also tell others. So they too can be followers of Jesus. I think of a comment Jordan had for devotions. As he was in a Walmart store and was witnessing a, a robbery, I believe. He said this, we're in a sad world. And the sad world we live needs Jesus. And you're right, Jordan. I'm not sure. I can't put lies on you this morning, but I know you're here. But again, it's a, again, again another picture of what this world needs. I want to back my thoughts up a little bit. Before I got started in, in Luke 19 here, Jesus had a parable for the people. Before he mounted that coat, he had a parable of the mites. And again, it was a nobleman that went into a foreign country. And this parable was speaking to the people. This, par this nobleman was a parable of Jesus, who was going to leave this world, but at the same time return as a king. The servants the king, the servants the king charged with a task to represent followers of Jesus. I'm sorry, with a task to present followers of Jesus. The Lord has given us val the valuable commission that we must be faithful to and serve him until he returns. Upon his return, Jesus will ascend the as certain as faithfulness of his own people that they have done a good work. That we might be gloried by the Father. And that we might inherit that reward that he's going to give to us. There is a promised reward for those who are faithful. Who are faithful. There is a reward. But again, as Jesus told that parable... He was speaking about himself. Of this nobleman that's going to be leaving but be returning someday. As Jesus came into further down the road, he came to Jericho. And again, he stopped and he wept. Now, through all the weeping, through all the celebration that was going around him that, at that time, 
What I see in this gospel message this morning of 19 is a sorrowful Jesus. A Jesus that had pain for you and I. He cared for us so much. As he looked out over Jerusalem, he was sorry that the people haven't turned their hearts towards him. They rejected him. He knew he was going to be rejected. He was going to be hung on the cross five days from there. They were going to crucify him. Because I think about, maybe what Jesus was thinking about was 40 years later, what was going to take place. As he overlooked the Jerusalem, I'm sure he saw the vast temple. But as history tells us, 40 years later, the temple was going to be destroyed by the Romans. It wasn't until the AD 135 when the Romans came in and totally destroyed Jerusalem. Drove all the Jews out from the land, from their place. He put them into the four corners of the earth. The Jews were scattered. And it's sorry to say, as we think about history, as we think about what took place that time, we think what the Jews have been through for so many years. We think about Hitler as he came and killed over six million of them. But there is hope for the Jews, there's hope for all of us. This King Jesus will come back. And I can go into Revelations, and it's going to work quite different. Instead of a donkey, he's coming on a white horse as a warrior. And most times back then, as kings were conquerors, they would come, they would have a white horse pour in their chariots. That's how they would have done it when one kingdom fell and another kingdom picked that other one up or one city was destroyed. The king would ride in his white horse and his chariot with his white horse. And we see that in Revelations that's going to take place. He will come back as a king of kings and lords of lords. As Revelation tells us in chapter 11. Now, from John, was t- this is John saying this. Now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it was called faithful and true and in righteousness. He judges and makes war. His eyes were like flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with robe dripped in blood, and the name, his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him to the white horse, on the white horse. And now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword. And with it, he shall strike the nations. For himself, he will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierce and wrath of the almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. My friends, that's going to happen. When, I don't know. But again, he was come back. He will set up his kingdom again. He will call back the people, the Jews again, from all four corners of the earth, back to his nation. They are his apple of his eye, and he will return their favor to them, his hearts to them again. But in those times, there's a lot of suffering. As I said, Hitler, and there's more to come. We know right now Israel is in tremendous into another war. They will not be defeated. But again, there's still signs of prophecy. There's more to come to Israel, to the city of Jerusalem. But again, we can't lose our focus. As when Jesus comes back, he will strike all nations, all people that do not believe in him. And that's the cry this morning as we think about this coming week. He died for you and I so we can have life. Do we celebrate him? Do we honor him? Do we glorify him? Do we tell other people about him? Is he Lord of your life? Because if he's not Lord of your life, I have to ask the question, what does he mean to you? 
This King of Kings and Lord of Lords will come back. And he will defeat the enemy. The enemy is Satan. He will be defeated. I failed to mention that it's Palm Sunday today, but it also our Council Sunday. I apologize for that. I apologize for that. I was going to make mention before I got started my service. So I do want to take some time to think about count or when we call Council Sunday, what that looks like as we as believers, as we as members here at Martindale. Again, as I before I get into that, just one more thought I want to let with you. This week, wherever you at, at work, play, studies, take some time. Celebrate. Thank Jesus for what he's going to do for us, what he did for us this coming week. He bore our sins, all of it, every last one away from us, willing to die, willing to give up his life to die for you and I. That's the thought I want to let with you. But as I transition to the thought of Council Sunday, about three quarters, three quarters of a year ago, I'm thinking it's towards the spring of the year, June, July, I can't remember, we were giving out the teaching team here in the district, and Daryl was the forefront, forefront of the Martindale District Membership Information, it's called. Again, every church in the district has these for their members, and it's uh, united together as one, as a body of brotherhood. But again, I want to thank Daryl for his, again, his, all his wisdom and the teaching team for the wisdom they put into all of this. And I'm not sure if you all got one, but I will say this. If you haven't got one, I do have two stacks in the back. Please feel free to help yourself to one or two if you feel you need to for your family. But why am I bringing this this morning? Again, it's just a refresher to know what our commitment is to the brotherhood. As we think about the Martindale District member information in the, again, in the first, uh, I believe it was, I don't have my pages here, but in the first um, pages from 1 to 26, you're going to see the 1963 Confession of Faith. So not to confuse you again, this is just again to give, give you, if you were confused, just hopefully I can set light to this. We used to have this book, the Mennonite Conf Confession of Faith, it's a little green book. That's on 1963. But this here was injected into the first 26 pages of the district of the members information booklet. So nothing has changed out of this. This was just trans transported into this member information. But as you turn the next page to page 28, if you have them with, you're going to see, you're going to come to the Martindale District Members Commitment. And it says this, our members, to, our members commitment is divided into three sections with a total of 12 commitments. The three sections are serving the righteous king by submitting to his reign is number two. And the third, and sharing the relevant gospel to the world. I'm sorry, sharing the relevant gospel. And it says go and make disciples. Those are the three sections. But again, there is with with total of 12 commitments. And I would like to look at two of those commitments right now. If you have your book with you, you can turn to page 28. But the first commitment for us as members says this. I won't read it all. Again, I'm just briefing some of this to, again to know as what our responsibility is as members. I'm committed to make Jesus Lord of my life and follow him in obedience of one of his disciples. I have accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior and Lord of my life. I believe the grace of God and the presence of the Holy Spirit has enabled me to follow Jesus faithfully. 
I will develop habits of prayer, fasting, scripture reading, and studying. Believing the Bible is the inspired word of God and a standard for the faith and practices. As a disciple of Jesus, I will abide in his word in order to bear fruit. The second one, a kingdom citizen. I am committed to living a life that characterizes the peace of serving love, overcoming evil with good, non-resistance, whether that, whether that adversary comes from the brother, a stranger, or from, for, from another country. By declaring that Jesus is Lord, I recognize I'm part of a kingdom of God and a pilgrim, pilgrim of this world. I'm going to stop there. But again, two commitments. Lordship of salvation and a kingdom citizen. Again, as I would encourage you, if you haven't, is to read your commitment. Because I want to add a comment a little later about that. But as I read this first two commitments, Chad brought in about we had a very enriched weekend with the district. With EMM there, again, this idea of mission. What does mission look like? And this idea that was presented as we're all missionaries. It's not just your pastors or your bishops or your lay leaders, whoever that might be. Everyone that has a believer in Jesus Christ is a missionary. And again, I guess, again, there's a, a lot of points that we took from that. But I asked the question, if each one of us would become a missionary to someone, talk to one person, how would that change the world? Right now, over, there's 40 I believe I got this right. There's 40% of people groups that have not heard the gospel yet in this world. It comes to a staggering number like 6 million people. 6 million people have not heard the gospel. So I asked the question this morning, do I care? Do you care? As we think about what we're in this coming week, of what Jesus did for you and I, do we care? Have our hearts been turned towards him? And wondering. Martindale District members information. We started council in our church here. Thank you, Daryl. As we think about starting council in this church, which some of it has already started, some of you have received phone calls from some of your pastors. And again, you also, in your mailboxes, were giving a paper. It was a council questionnaire. Three questions. Do you have peace with God and man? Was the number one. Do you have a desire to share in the communion service? Number two, can you affirm the acceptance of the district member's covenant? So that's why I asked the question, have you read the district member's covenant? Because if you're answering line three with a yes and haven't read it, where does that put you? So I think it's important when we say yes to things, we should know what we're saying yes to. So again, I just want to emphasize that this morning. It is important. You're a body of believers as a brotherhood coming together as one body. And again, in this book, in the conclusion in the back on page 38, it says this. Those who choose to become members of our district churches will have the opportunity to reaffirm their commitment each year through the each year through our regular process of council and questionnaires or or home visits. These commitments are intended to represent our best effort to be faithful to the Lord Jesus and and his example and his teaching for us. The doctrine that was delivered by the prophets and the life and practices that we believe will encourage faithfulness by all of us, conservative Anabaptists. We believe that we will be healthier church when we all of us are willing to commit to one another and be held accountable by one another through our commitment. So again, food for thought. 
do we believe it's important to be part of a body? If we believe it's important to be part of a body of believers, faithful believers, as we understand, as understand Scripture, as you see in this booklet, many verses that underline with blue writing, the blue writing that underline, stating where we got our, our firmness from, what we believe, what we believe Jesus is calling us to. Jesus is calling us to be faithful followers. That's his call. And that call is to go to all people. Yes, it might look different sometimes. But again, is this call that people can have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And also, uh, hopefully this church be, can be a church of accountability. Accountability that means we hold each other accountable for what we say and what we do. If that's not the case, I wonder where that will put us down the road. If we don't commit to each other, I have my thoughts where that could take us. But again, these are my thoughts. They're not your thoughts. And again, I will rest in that. But again, as we continue our journey living faithful believers, living for the Lordship of Jesus Christ, let's do it together. Let's become hand in hand. Let's walk the narrow road together. Because as we go into history here in the future, again, I do not want to spoil this week. But things are not going to get easier. The evil one will bring their oppression even harder. He will drive his hand even harder. But my friends, victory will become when our king returns on his white horse to redeem us. To take us home. It might not be in our time, but maybe our children's children's time. So let's do the best to raise them, give them life, again to be followers of Jesus Christ. We're going to have a song, and then I'm going to turn it over to Brother John. Please turn in your Zion's praises. To song number 16.